Upper line temperatures uh, lower 70s along the lake shore mid 70s here in Grand Rapids. But uh, you know if your mind is set to it you probably could have pulled it off pretty easily and the days ahead certainly it is going to be conducive for that uh, right now we've got uh, beautiful conditions outside actually I went outside just to kind of check on things there's no motion in the air the winds are completely calm here at Fox 17 on the north side of Grand Rapids it's just a really nice evening out there mostly clear skies and north winds there they are officially from the airport at three miles per hour I don't feel anything here though as uh, numbers are as low as the upper 50s in Big Rapids Muskegon at 59 South Haven and Benton Harbor in the upper 50s as well. So yet another night where we've got a very dry air mass, very light winds and clear skies. So temperatures are going to fall off to their maximum. I don't think that's going to be a whole lot tonight, but lower 50s likely for a lot of us to begin tomorrow morning. High temperatures today on the board, reaching the mid to even upper 70s here. Kalamazoo at 78, uh, 76 in Battle Creek. A lot of us, though, I think mainly in the mid 70s, the lakeshore a few degrees cooler as a lake breeze did arrive by early afternoon. Now, here's the shot across the country. I want you to take a look out west. Phoenix at 101, Vegas 101. How about Portland at 93? An expanding area of warm, even hot air, and that is going to start to shift across the country here later this week and have huge implications on our weekend forecast. Still looking at a potential 90 by Sunday, I do believe. Winds very light, as I talked about. Dew points, a measure of the amount of water vapor in the air when they're in the 40s here in early June. That's like uh, absolutely no humidity. And on a night when I didn't get any pictures sent to me, Ron Topping, he's there as always with this beautiful uh, image from out in the Muskegon area, looking out over the waters of Lake Michigan at uh, Pier Marquette Park. So thanks to Ron Topping for that. And uh, well, I guess thanks to the weatherman for all this great weather, right? We don't have much going on. There could be a spotty shower due to this little impulse coming northward tomorrow afternoon. Folks, don't count on it. Don't count on it. Most of us won't see it. High temps back into the mid 70s. I talk about this big warm up though by the weekend. Derek and Ryan, I've got it coming up. All right, thank you for that. A backlog of appointments at Secretary of State branches is only growing. But as our Aaron Parsegian explains, two new bills in Lansing aim to help the department catch up. From pandemic-related closures to adopting an appointment-only system, the virtual waiting lines to get an appointment at Secretary of State offices are growing. The pandemic greatly impacted our office's capacity to provide in-person services. Exposures to the virus forced staff to stay home and offices to temporarily close. And expiration extensions created a backlog of resident transactions that are now all due right now at the same time. But Benson says two bills introduced Tuesday could help eliminate that backlog. COVID caused the backlog we face right now, which is why our bills would utilize federal COVID relief funding from the American Rescue Plan to fund these overtime hours and deliver the customer service our residents need and deserve. Democratic State Representative Stephanie Young and Julie Brixey want to use $25 million in COVID relief money to pay tens of thousands of hours in overtime and hire more than 200 full-time staff at SOS branches through the end of September. One of the most common complaints we've heard about Secretary of State branches over the past several decades is that the branches are understaffed. Residents go in and they see all the vacant windows that are not staffed. What residents often don't know is that many of the branches were built when the Secretary of State's budget was nearly double what it is today. They say 500,000 more appointments will be created if the bills pass soon. And we hope the legislature will join us in enacting them. In an interview with Fox 17, Secretary Benson says the legislature underfunding the department for years has in part created the issues we see today. So the result of decades of, of cuts to our office, the amount of people needing services is more than the amount of transactions slots that are available and that would be true whether walk-in uh, whether people were able to walk in or make an appointment she's also calling for the legislature to waive late fees during this time while the department looks at ways to fix backlogs specifically with title transfers so this is a challenging moment we're in uh, but we're going to get through it and we're going to continue to listen to our residents and find ways to address particular and specific transaction needs for fox 17 news i'm aaron parsegian Benson is also reminding people that even with the backlog, people can still schedule their visits a day beforehand because each day offices release thousands of new appointments at 8 a.m. and noon. A woman in Muskegon County alive thanks to a yeah. teenage boy. He also happens to be an Eagle Scout, and this weekend he'll be recognized by the organization for his heroic actions. 
it felt like forever. It, it seemed like everything was moving in slow motion. It was July of 2018. Michael Van Allsburg was working when he heard a crash near the intersection of East Apple and South Maple. It's, you're like, you're trying to process all your thoughts. When he ran over to see what happened, he found two vehicles, a pickup truck and a sedan, which had been severely damaged. When Michael went to check on the woman inside, not only was she visibly upset, but he says smoke began coming from the hood of the car. I tried all the doors on the vehicle and the doors wouldn't open. I don't know if the, the, the car twisted or if she had them locked. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, and I'm trying to communicate with the lady through the window and you know, you ever try to talk to someone through glass, it doesn't work very well. A co-worker ended up coming over and helped him bend the car's door frame just as the fire began. Michael was then able to raise the steering wheel, unbuckle the victim, and with the help of some other witnesses, managed to lift the woman out of the car. It wasn't even 10 seconds later, he says, the inside of the vehicle went up in flames. And I was like, we gotta get her further away from that. So we, we, we moved her up onto this, uh, the grassy section here and some first responders had came and they had checked the lady out and they took her away. Uh, I don't want to disclose anything that happened with her, but um, she, uh, she is all right. Michael, who's now 19 years old, credits the lessons he learned in the Boy Scouts for helping him keep his cool that day. His actions now earning him the Heroism Award, which is one of three life-saving awards the Boy Scouts gives out. I didn't do it to be recognized for it, but it's nice that um, somebody is recognizing it. Not that that's why I did it. And while many say the teen was a hero that day, he says it was simply the right thing to do. It's another day at work. Now, obviously, I don't deal with that on a daily basis, but, um, you know, you, you, I don't, yeah, it just was another day. Um, you know, I was raised up. You always help people when you can, and I saw an opportunity to help somebody, so I did. <laughs> Indeed, he did help. Michael's a member of Troop 1127. In fact, he'll be receiving his award this Saturday during a ceremony at Pomona Park in Fruitport. Well deserved. Awesome. Well, as of this week, those receiving unemployment will once again need to prove they are searching for a job. Because now there are, in many areas, jobs available. And so the, the goal now is to hopefully get people back to work who can go back to work. What you'll need to know and show in order to continue receiving benefits. An historic Mackinac Island cottage breaking under flames over the holiday weekend with multiple departments pitching in to try and save the landmark where it stands tonight. They were killing people and burning houses. And the 100 year anniversary of a dark mark in our nation's soul. The story of the Tulsa massacre still to come. Well, right now, more than 242,000 people across our state are still unemployed. And for those who are receiving benefits, they need to prove they're actually looking for work. This week, the state's unemployment insurance agency reinstated the work search requirement. And it's important to make sure that you document everything, because if you make mistakes, there's a chance that you will not get benefits or you'll have to pay them back. Because there, because everything was so in flux, the work search requirement was able to be waived. Michigan's Unemployment Insurance Agency is updating its requirements. During COVID, people did not have to prove they were looking for a job to collect benefits, but that all changed starting May 30th. Because now there are, in many areas, jobs available. And so the, the goal now is to hopefully get people back to work who can go back to work. Starting this week, if you're claiming benefits, you must actively be searching for a job and conduct at least one work search activity a week. Then report what you did when you certify. Those will not be paid until everything's been reported to the UIA. Rachel Cole has been an unemployment advocate for more than seven years, directing the Workers' Rights Clinic at the University of Michigan Law School. But most people that are trying to look, go back to work are, are trying to find that next job and they're applying to anything that looks within the realm of something that they're interested in doing and have the capability of doing. You'll need specific details about the search when submitting to the UIA. The date of contact, which has to fall within your certification week, the activity like submitting an application and attending a job fair, name of the employer or online employment service, their address or website and how you contacted them, whether in person or by phone or email. The agency can ask you to verify your submissions anytime. If they're inaccurate or incomplete, you may have to pay benefits back. Also, make sure to save all your emails or documents for proof. The agency recommends that you keep records for up to up to two years. I recommend you keep them up to six. The agency may or may not have the ability to go back and look at it and then 
assess you later, much later in time after that. A waiver may be granted for certain COVID-19 reasons. If your child is learning remotely because school is closed, you can't work due to allowable COVID-19 reasons, or if you're self-employed receiving pandemic unemployment assistance. And if you're still on the job with hours reduced, you may qualify as well. Because if the employer wants to keep you and has the, and believes that they're going to be able to return you to full-time work, they can fill out a waiver for you on your behalf, and that waiver will apply for you so that you don't have to look for additional work and you can just keep collecting underemployment. You have to apply for the waiver before certifying, and you'll be notified right away whether it's granted. The biggest advice Cole offers is be truthful. If you're filing false information, that's fraud. And the agency would then have to charge you with fraud. Um, and then you'd have to pay back every single dollar that you've ever gotten from unemployment benefits. And there's also a penalty involved as well. So you can report your work search requirements on your MyWAM or over the phone with Marvin at the number right there at the bottom of your screen. So if we go a little more in depth with these search work requirements, you can request a waiver through MyWAM. Just log in under Claimant Services tab, click on Request a COVID-19 Work Search Waiver. That waiver can be granted for two weeks up to September 4th, 2021. If it's denied, you can reapply in two weeks. So when you submit your work search, you can't just apply for the same position within a four-week period and say you did it last week and just keep doing it or just browse websites. You have to submit a completed application. Also, if you get a job offer and do not have a good cause for refusing it, you will be disqualified. If you do not complete the work search on any given week, you will also be ineligible that week as well. They cannot be made up and there's no good cause for failing to do it. So again, if you forget one week, you can't just file a work search for a previous week. You just miss out. All of these rules and more can be found on this story at fox17online.com. Well, fire breaking out at an historic cottage on Mackinac Island over the weekend. It's just part of Mackinac. It really is. And they, they're very significant to the beauty of the island. The efforts it took to keep the landmark from being a total loss. Hey, Ryan and Derek, I've been talking about this uh, pop up shower potential Wednesday. Uh, it's not going to be much. I mean, it's so few and far between the European model. It's scanning around and it sees virtually nothing. So don't count on much. And if we don't get much tomorrow, folks, there's nothing through the weekend but a big warm up. I've got it here in just a few. Well, a fire breaking out over the weekend on Mackinac Island at the historic Brigadoon Cottage. With the efforts of three fire departments, they were able to prevent it from being a total loss. Kevin Hodge shows us the damage. It's just part of Mackinac. It really is. And they, they're very significant to the beauty of the island. The Brigadoon Cottage on Mackinac Island is one of many on the main road, often viewed by the many tourists who visit. On Sunday, the Mackinac Island Fire Department responded to a fire in the building. With help from the Mackinac City and St. Ignis Fire Departments, they managed to put it out before the cottage became a total loss. We have mutual aid with St. Ignis in Mackinac City, and those men came over, and it is very reassuring to know that we have that extra help when we need it. Shepler's Ferry brought over the two assisting departments. I know so many people rely on transportation to and from the island and for us to be play a small part in, in uh, getting that fire out, it was a pleasure for us to do. One tourist on the scene said the departments were doing all they could to stop the flames. Right away they, um, they got hoses set up, um, they were getting uh, on all angles. They put a lot of water, especially with the, the fire truck and the fire cannon, just getting water on the surrounding areas, um, trees, houses, making sure nothing was going to spread. While the roof sustained heavy damage, the rest of the building was intact and no injuries were reported. Uh, no injuries, uh, save the other buildings on both sides, and uh, it was just uh, remarkable. The Mackinac Island Fire Department has yet to release the cause of the fire. That was Kevin Hodge reporting. Meanwhile, new business in Muskegon Heights filling a gap in the community in more ways than one. It's called the Business Cafe, where people who live there can have the chance to dream. It started out as a nonprofit that helped house people with disabilities, but has grown into a space with broader use where middle schoolers can do their homework and entrepreneurs can develop their businesses like iPhone repair and graphic design, among others, providing a welcome and nurturing environment for all. They've been knowing me since I was this big. 
<laughs> so it's always good to see them having their dream. They see my dream. I think this is the first place that people can actually go to and actually feel comfortable. Yeah, the Business Cafe says their Wi-Fi is incredibly fast and the caffeine is plenty. So if you're looking for a unique, inspiring workspace, you might want to check <laughs> them out. Pro Caffeine's Andrew. always a good reason. Yeah, that's <laughs> good enough to get you up for sure. Today marking the 100th year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. President Biden there to remember it all. The generational wealth that you have today, the land that you have today, uh, all of that began with all that destruction. Why people have been calling for reparations for years and why now could be the time to finally get things done. Brian, it's all about a big, big warm up over the next several days. You can see all these red boxes. Uh, why is tomorrow's number in gray? Well, that's gray because it's the high, the average high for tomorrow. 76, we get there, 80s and possibly low 90s by early next week. Full forecast just a few minutes away. Today, President Biden in Oklahoma commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. But even a century later, the racial divide in our nation still runs deep. Britt Conway talked with one of the last remaining survivors and also has a look ahead at the battle over reparations. Greenwood, Oklahoma, 1921, a vibrant, affluent city within a city in North Tulsa, home to more than 300 black-owned businesses where entrepreneurs, art and culture flourished. It became known as Black Wall Street. Now, it's known as the site of a horrific massacre. Viola Fletcher was just seven years old then. They were killing people and burning houses. We could see people running and people laying on the ground, probably bleeding from being shot and killed. As many as 300 were killed. Smell smoke with houses burning. A community burned to the ground, 35 city blocks destroyed, 10,000 black Tulsans left homeless. For decades, there have been calls for reparations. The generational wealth that you have today, the land that you have today, uh, all of that began with all that destruction. But now, with Democrats controlling the U.S. House and Senate, a renewed hope. And Monday, President Joe Biden said, The federal government must reckon with and acknowledge the role that it has played in stripping wealth and opportunity from black communities. Half a city block is all that's left of Greenwood now, and it's mostly white-owned. But for Viola, the loss, the fear, remain. I'm afraid that something like that might happen again. I'm Britt Conway reporting. City of Tulsa, meanwhile, will begin exhuming bodies, possible victims of the massacre, but the path to some sort of justice is still unclear. All right, Derek, let's go. 1032 weather forecast time and uh, really nice outside. I mean, if you've been outside in the past couple hours, you know what I'm talking about. Just perfect evening conditions, no wind to clear skies, just feels great. Can we keep it going? Can we improve upon perfect? Well, it depends on your perspective. Do you like it warm? Do you like it hot? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but it's coming later this week, folks. Wednesday planner, here we go on this uh, sunrise at 606. These days just incredibly long at this point. 915 is the sun down. Folks, we're hanging on to some, you know, barely a daylight all the way close to 10 o'clock now. And as you know, right along the lakeshore, that's about the uh, the latest possible time that you can get daylight because across the lake, that's the central time zone. And uh, just uh, what is it? Uh, three weeks from now, just shy of that, the longest day of the year, you will see some daylight even after 10 o'clock. 52 though, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. We bottom out. I've got it uh, 52 tonight. 73 at midday, 76 I've got for a daytime high. Last night I had 78 for tomorrow. Have taken that down a couple degrees. We'll see about it. I think there's going to be some extra clouds tending to show up late morning and afternoon. Probably always some breaks through the afternoon, but a definitive increase in clouds as a weather system grazes down to our southeast. A stray sprinkle or shower has potential to surface during the afternoon. I can't rule that out. We've been talking about it for a few days, but uh, the prospects for any appreciable rain are pretty low and the majority of locations and hours tomorrow understand will be dry around West Michigan. The bigger story is going to be some heat that ramps up late week. We'll get to that momentarily and eventually even some humidity 
two by the time we're talking, say, perhaps as early as Sunday, but I think more particularly Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So that's still se several days away. This off the European model, I'm mentioning this uh, stray or spotty shower potential for tomorrow. It's so few and far between that this global model, this European model, doesn't even really detect it. But there could be, could be a pop-up shower. I think there will be, yes, a couple showers on that radar tomorrow afternoon. But if you get it, you're unlucky or lucky, depending upon your perspective, considering we've got the drought conditions uh, still ongoing around here. Lots of heat out west. Now, these are the highs from today. Over 100, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Las Vegas at 103. My buddy, who I interned with at uh, WGN in Chicago, works under Tom Skilling. He's out there in Arizona. He's telling me about the uh, seven-day forecast from the local weather guy. It's got 100 to 100 and 510 every day that he's on vacation for the next week. So a lot of heat out west, expanding northward, expanding in our direction. It does appear by, say, Thursday, but especially Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and into the early to middle parts of next week. These are current numbers on the board now, so obviously a little bit cooler as we've gotten into the evening. Current temperatures around West Michigan, as cool as the mid to upper 50s, where radiational cooling conditions have taken effect. Clear skies, light winds, dry air mass, South Haven to Benton Harbor, but uh, as uh, mild, yes, as the mid 60s locally, pretty comparable around the Midwest. Winds, there they are. Virtually nothing as we speak. Now, this big warm-up we've been talking about recently, 84 by Friday. The best sunshine to be Saturday and Sunday, upper 80s to near 90, and may in fact hit 90 on Sunday. Not ready to commit to that yet, but nonetheless, 90 or thereabouts Monday and Tuesday. Live radar has nothing happening. You come out wider with the scope. There is a weather system down across, oh, coming out of Missouri, southern Illinois, and Indiana, lifting northward. But the trajectory of this takes the majority of the moisture down to our southeast, uh, getting into the Detroit area there tomorrow afternoon. On the very northwest flank of it, there could be enough moisture in the atmosphere, coupled with the warming that goes on during the morning and early afternoon to pop a renegade shower that the model's not showing. So don't be completely shocked if you do get a little bit of rain on your windshield driving around tomorrow afternoon. Then there's a second disturbance overnight Thursday or late Thursday evening that could could bring a shower there very early Friday morning. Don't count on that either. I mean, this is like trying to really find something that's not there. And once it goes bye bye, those two chances, minimal chances, Ryan and Derek, Nothing coming over the next several days, but near 90 starting on Sunday. All right, warm-ups back. Thanks, Anthony. Showdown of the lunch.